Hey, it's Karen. Welcome to this episode of A Touch of Genius, your place to get curious about your personal ingenuity and develop your potential. Together, we're going to discover how to break down and break through limitations so we can shine brighter. We'll find out how this helps us create a better life experience wherever we are and explore its far-reaching implications. We'll also be learning more about how someone else's touch of genius impacts us. Get your notebook and cookies ready, and let's dive into this episode. Hello, geniuses. How are you? First of all, I'd like to thank all of you wonderful people for sharing your feedback on the first episode. It's really encouraging, and I really appreciate that you're finding inspiration from it. I get that starting a podcast at a time when we could all just go dark as we witness so much conflict, uncertainty, and economical stress around the world could seem quite naive. Yet, I've always believed in the power of kindness and positivity, even if some people in situations haven't always been kind to me. So let's keep shining our light around the world, shall we? Think of Ted Lasso. People thought he was a pushover for his kindness and humor. But when they got to know him, he was deep, sensitive, and out of that, he found his strength to make some powerful decisions and create a beautiful impact. This shouldn't just be left for imaginary characters on TV shows. It should be our core operating system as a society, don't you think? Hey, I know it's challenging to act like that when, for example, someone is speeding up behind you on the motorway and flips their middle finger at you when you finally pull over to let them pass. It's poor behavior, and it's not nice, but we'll talk about attitudes in another episode. We're all being called to make powerful decisions, not just for our own mental sanity and emotional well-being, but for the people who surround us as well. We will never be able to control how other people choose to react or respond to our choices, nor should we, but we will be able to use our energy and personal resources more effectively. I do believe that this is the most powerful and beautiful domino effect that we can have on our closest and even farthest connections. Is it crazy to talk about how we can become more brilliant? No. I think we need to hear more of it. Is it pointless to think that each one of us can truly make significant positive changes in our world? No. Just look at how it happens with the contrary. If we really want to turn this ship around, it's up to us. And it's going to take some inner work. Are you with me? Awesome. So, now that we got that out of the way, let's dig into today's topic. You. Back when you were an infant, you couldn't really choose what happened to you. You could scream or cry, but your adults didn't always understand what your needs were. It was a constant juggle until they figured out when you were hungry, when you were tired, when you wanted a hug, or when you dropped a number two. Ew. Over the years, however, you developed the ability to communicate your needs and express your wants. Whether you got them or not, it's a different story. This phase in which you learned to speak up was one of the most crucial phases in your early development, not just at an interpersonal level, but also for your inner dialogue and your inner world that you created. I don't have an inner world, Karen. Yes, you do. You may have forgotten it or even stopped believing in it. I'm not a kid anymore, Karen. Really? So, when you walk into an ice cream parlor, you don't immediately get transported to some sweet childhood ice cream dream? Or when you smell freshly baked cookies, you don't recall some fun times with your family? I didn't have an easy childhood, Karen. I'm sorry to hear that. Even more reason, then, to rescue your inner child who is still in there somewhere, wishing for that innocence to be hugged, healed, and respected. More than this, your inner child, that pure part of you, wants you to remember who you really are at the core and bring more of your essence into the adult version of you now. Childlike, not childish. There's a big difference when you think about either word. One of the key components to recovering our childlike essence is imagination. Over the years, I've met many adults who told me that they had no imagination. Are you one of those people who thinks they don't have imagination? Well, I'm going to break it down and help you bring it back to your life. It will help you across all key areas of your life, and especially if you have kids or work with them. Imagination is merely a creation of the mind. It's the act of forming an idea, of creating a mental image of something that we can't yet sense or perceive in reality. What is imagination based on? Thoughts. It's that simple. Now, we all have thoughts, don't we? Therefore, if we all have thoughts, we must all have some form of imagination, right? We're constantly creating pictures and movies in our minds of what may happen in our lives. That said, some people have certain conditions that don't allow them to create a mental image in their minds. If you're one of those people, I'd love to talk to you. 
Imagination has become another one of those big words that people shy away from. It's become so heavily associated with creativity from an artistic viewpoint that because so many people don't think of themselves as creative because they are not artistic, they somehow think they don't have imagination. Yet they do. By the way, this is how belief systems build their little fortresses. If I believe X, then I must also believe Y. But what if you change belief X? Will it alter belief Y as well? It's a bit like changing one digit in the matrix. The whole program shifts. But I'm getting ahead of myself. If imagination is just a construct of the mind, then we all have it and use it somehow. The question is, how are you using yours? Are you using it to create pleasing experiences? Or are you using it to create chaos, stress and drama? Are you using it to create a positive worldview where possibility exists? Or are you using it to create a grim view of the world where things are impossible? I hear it all the time in certain circles, and people don't seem to realize the correlation between what they think, what they say, and how they perceive and live their reality. Have you ever noticed that people who constantly say things are complicated always end up having complicated lives? How we think about something will determine the experience that we have of it. One person can view the same situation as complicated, whilst another can view it as nothing of great importance. The power of how they think about it is what defines the level of difficulty or ease. We all write countless scripts in our heads, and many of them, lo and behold, happen like magic, whether we like them or not. Why? It comes down to energy and magnetism. If you're not up to speed with how our personal energy contributes to positive or negative outcomes in our lives, I invite you to start looking into this, although we'll come back to it often throughout this podcast, from different angles and with different words so you can fully integrate it. For today, our focus is imagination. What I see has happened with many people as they become adults is that they've lost their childlike imagination. The one where pure, positive, unbridled creation lives. The one where bizarre ideas can actually come true. The one where incredible inventions actually get constructed, even if it's out of cardboard boxes at first. The one where dreams start to take shape. It's as though many people are stuck with a monster in their closet, and their life becomes a series of scary outcomes. What if the closet were full of cute plush animals instead? Stop and think about it for a second. What are your predominant thoughts around your personal situations? Think of that person who flipped me off in traffic the other day, because that comment earlier was based on a real life experience. She obviously didn't start her day very well, because she was dumping some uncool vibes my way as she almost pushed me out of my lane with her impatience. I could have passed that uncool energy onto somebody else, but I didn't want to make my day a series of uncool events for myself or other people. So it stopped with me and I turned up the music in the car to listen to a cool tune. I literally tuned into happy. I chose which thoughts I let dominate the rest of my ride home, even though I didn't really appreciate that gesture. The person in the other car, however, may well have kept tuning into unhappy whilst at the same time blaming everyone else for the domino effect of this attitude throughout her day. All of those events, however seemingly trivial at times, are constructs of our minds. We get to choose different attitudes which create different outcomes every time. This is just one example of many that happen throughout our days, based on the things that we imagine to be true. Think as well of how your kids are already having their imagination impacted by the joys and stresses of your own life. Your own attitude is informing and shaping theirs to some extent. When they're younger, it's not always easy to tell which direction they will take, and we also have to remember that they too have free will. It is, however, easier to help them build up their own positive imagination. I once gave a six-year-old boy a cardboard box to play with. He turned it into a train, a car, a protective little fortress seat to watch TV from, an improvised catchment device to roll marbles into, and a whole slew of other things that he could think of. It was a beautiful thing to witness. And it wasn't just what he did with the box, but the conversations that stemmed from those different iterations. This is where precious bonding time happens between an adult and a child, and the adult's inner child who is also wanting to play. It's also where imagination starts to build upon itself, creating a sense of possibility and probability. How many kids these days actually do that sort of stuff, without having a mobile phone shoved in their hands to keep them quiet while parents lounge on the couch or talk to their friends? Hey, I have nothing against parents lounging on couches or talking to their friends, but if it means ignoring their child's brain health and development, then we've got stuff to talk about. But first, I'd like to talk about today's genius of importance. A woman whose deep curiosity helped shape a different form of education, one which is in use today in many public and private schools around the world, Maria Montessori. Maria Montessori was an Italian physician and educator. 
She's best known for her philosophy of education and for her writing on scientific pedagogy. She became one of the first women to attend medical school in Italy, graduating with honors in 1896. As part of her work after graduating, she visited asylums in Rome where she observed children with mental disabilities. These observations were fundamental to her future educational work, which later expanded to children without mental disabilities as well. Montessori's observations of behaviors in these young children are what formed the foundation of her educational method. She discovered that given the freedom to choose their activities, children showed more interest in practical activities and Montessori's materials than in toys provided for them. They were also surprisingly unmotivated by sweets and other rewards. This sounds very different right now in a world that has become so reward-centric, doesn't it? Over time, Montessori witnessed a spontaneous self-discipline emerge. She also came to believe that recognizing all children as individuals and treating them as such would yield better learning and fulfilled potential in each particular child. One of the things that Montessori strongly emphasized was not to mix fantasy with play or imagination during a child's early years, because this can confuse their sense of reality. Children up to about six years old need to understand the world around them as it is, and it's after this phase that they can start to integrate fantasy, as that is when the brain learns to differentiate between fantasy and reality. Right now, a four-year-old child watching a movie about a monster hiding in the closet or under their bed will not fully understand that it's a fantasy thing, so they will start to fear that there really is a monster there. How many sleepless nights have you had as a parent because of that? Right, you probably didn't know it, but now you do. So let's keep the idea of monsters, friendly or not, out of their minds until they're about seven years old if we can, okay? When we look at the core stages of a child's development, this is what we find. The first stage, which is toddler to six years old, the child's mind is absorbent, ready to learn, and has a strong desire to be physically independent. Hence the need for real stuff, not fantasy. A plush owl, for example, not an invented creature. Second stage, six to 12 year olds, the child is moving towards mental independence and is ready to start understanding more abstract concepts, hence the introduction of fantasy. Now you can bring in the invented creatures. The third stage, 12 to 18 year olds, the adolescent begins to understand their place in the world and to take more control over their life. We'll talk about adolescence in future episodes. Montessori definitely invested a lot of time observing children, making her own discoveries about child development. This quote from her book, The Child, Society and the World, helps us understand her view on imagination. We cannot make discoveries unless we can first imagine what we are seeking. We must not think that the imagination works only through fairy tales. All the intellect works like a form of the imagination. Imagination is the real substance of our intelligence. All theory and all progress comes from the mind's capacity to construct something. Sit with that last one for a moment. All progress comes from the mind's capacity to construct something. Imagination helps us shape our reality. It feeds into or clashes with our beliefs and convictions, which can either lock us into one way of thinking or free us up to have a more pleasing life experience. Imagination is also our safe space where nobody else needs to enter. In it, we can create our ideal world and begin to actualize it in real life, just as Montessori started to create her methodology through her observations and her imagination of what a different world could be. Now, when we read a book, for example, we're giving our mind the chance to create mental pictures of what the author is showing us. It helps build pathways in the brain that also impact attention span, patience, critical thinking, self-expression, emotional intelligence, and vocabulary. Versus giving a child a mobile phone to play games on, constantly seeing pictures of what someone else has already imagined. It shuts off a crucial part of their creative thinking if that's all they do. The same can be said about TV time. The thing is, as kids, most of us used to have a set time for that, with a set programming schedule that we couldn't record and play back later, and this was a small percentage of our activity time as kids. Now kids have access to screens everywhere. Phones, tablets, TVs, computers. Those pieces of plastic are almost glued to their noses as soon as they're out of school and before they go to bed, or when they wake up, or even during school depending on where they study. When do their eyes and brains have time to rest from those screens? When do they get to use their brains and hands for something else? When do they get to play in the dirt and build little cabins out of twigs and choose to do so instead of choosing to spend time with some digital device? Then people wonder why their children have trouble sleeping or have attention issues or can't communicate properly. It's not always a case of taking them to specialists, but of reducing their use of technology and giving them other fun things to naturally engage their brains with. 
This technology, useful as it can be, is not natural to human development. I'll say it again. It is not natural to human development. Back to imagination. Actually, let me pause here for a second, because I'd like to share a small challenge I've encountered as I create this podcast for you. When I thought of doing this podcast, which I've been thinking about for a couple of years now, the easy part, once I honed in on the main topic, which is a touch of genius, was to write out the episode list and start thinking of people I'd like to have as featured guests and and other stuff related to the content. That was easy because I'm a writer. I'm also someone who spends far more time listening to people than talking. And that's when I encountered my challenge. That's why you may hear my voice crackle or give a bit now and then, because I'm not used to this length of time talking, doing multiple takes to get one episode fine-tuned and ready for broadcast. I've done speeches and keynotes and presentations and interviews, but that's different. At least, recording a podcast is different for me. So I appreciate your patience with me as I face this unexpected challenge and work through it. I take it on with inspiration, along with lots of water with lemon, honey, and ginger. And if you have any tips or suggestions, I definitely welcome them. Thank you. Now, back to imagination. One of my favorite quotes from Pablo Picasso, renowned Spanish artist, is the following. Everything you can imagine is real. It's such a powerful quote because we literally can imagine anything into reality. We embody it through our imagination. We live it, we see it, we sense it, we feel it. Imagination is the bridge builder between what isn't and what is. It feeds into our view of ourselves, our capabilities, and of our surrounding world. For example, there have been studies of people who have imagined themselves playing the piano, and this advanced their brain function to such a degree, just like people who actually physically played the piano. You can read more about that in a brilliant book by Dr. Joe Dispenza called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Link in the show notes. Imagination is useful in business, not just to imagine a concept to work with, but then imagining the sort of team environment you want to have for it to be successful. Imagination helps us build a family, because first we imagine what kind of partner we'd like to have, and then we imagine what our family life will be like. Granted, not everything we imagine always turns out exactly as we imagined it, but if we didn't start somewhere, we wouldn't have any of it, would we? This leads me to the story of a little cartoon owl that a teenage girl once dreamed of having. Well, she dreamed of having her own cartoon character, and hers turned out to be an owl. That teenage girl was, you guessed it, me. And that owl is now called Nicky. Since I created him, he's become the main character of most of my published books, a cartoon I post on social media, and most importantly, an ambassador of love, joy, and imagination for children and adults around the world. He also hangs out at a lot of coffee shops and eats a lot of pastry with me. I wonder where he gets it from. I didn't just create Nicky Owl because I grew up with a love for classic characters like Garfield and Snoopy and wanted to have a character of my own, but because deep inside, my inner child wanted a friend. How many of us have had imaginary friends with whom we spent countless hours playing and having conversations? Where did they go? If you had one, what was yours called? It could also have been a plush toy, by the way. Our teenage years can be challenging for many reasons but mostly because it's a delicate time between the loss of childhood and the approach of adulthood. It's where our brains start using all of what we've learned from our parents, environment, and school, and start building our identity with. It's where we get asked to take on responsibilities that we didn't have before. Some of us have to grow up fast based on our family's socioeconomic status or geopolitical situations. Nobody really knows how to guide us through this teenage phase, And some kids turn to rebellious or destructive habits like smoking, drinking, running away from home, having questionable friends, vandalism, or even bullying. Other kids channel their energy into something more creative, constructive, or athletic. I was of the latter group. My love for cartoons, the books I read, and my little army of plush animals offered me a rich world in which to channel my imagination. Because of this, I felt the drive to create something of my own. That's how a little cartoon owl appeared on a sheet of paper on our living room center table one summer afternoon as I doodled away at different ideas. I then drew him on greeting cards, which I loved making and giving away. I got asked to make more for friends and family, and we'd send those overseas. Then I started to make a clay version. The owl figurine came to life. We had a hobby at home of making model airplanes, cars, and things, which gave me resources and resourcefulness to start making my own little scenes with my owl. I made a Romeo and Juliet balcony scene, I built a castle entrance with a moat and drawbridge. I made a pirate owl out of the remnants of a wooden ship I got bored with, but had all the parts left over, which served me for many of these creations. 
So many things that I made just because I imagined myself making them, sketched out the idea and made it happen. Eventually, I learned how to build websites and made one for Nikki Owl. I get that not all kids would do such a thing, but what if we gave more kids the creative space to imagine for themselves instead of cutting off their imagination with so much technology and academic saturation? I don't know why, but some schools just hammer them with homework. Imagination is key for innovation, creation and inspiration. It's key for imagining what one's life can become and then finding ways to make it happen. It's crucial for imagining the kind of world we wish to live in and then putting our time, resources and energy into realizing it. You may have already heard the following phrase, we become what we think about most of the time. This includes the situations in our lives because we see the world as we think it to be and we act upon those thoughts and feelings. That's how we create our reality. That's why we actually have more power than we often think we do to change things that we're not happy or satisfied with. The problem is we unknowingly give away our power and it starts with how we disempower ourselves with the way we think, what we imagine. When we use our thoughts to imagine negative outcomes, most of the time we will encounter negative outcomes. Think back on your own life, your own outcomes. Be radically honest with yourself. How many times have you imagined negative outcomes into fruition? How many times have you imagined positive outcomes into fruition? If you were to tally each one up, which one do you honestly think you've created more of in your life? Do it right now. Take a sheet of paper and draw a line down the middle of it. Label one column negative outcomes and the other column positive outcomes. Now go listing in each one things that you can think of until you naturally reach an end or fill up the column. If you happen to fill up more on the negative column, please don't think badly about yourself. This is merely an exercise in self-reflection so that you can see how you have been channeling your imagination in one direction or another. The beauty of it is that you get to change it if you don't like what you see. It may take some effort and a lot of conscious work, but it can definitely be improved. Sometimes we don't want to face the truth about how we've been thinking or how we've impacted our own lives by our thinking. It's bad enough that we may have gone through a lot of hardship or difficult relationships based on our imaginings. Bear in mind as well that I'm not saying that everything is by your own imagination because we are all co-creating and impacting each other somehow. So sometimes we do fall into other people's imaginings and they're not very pretty. However, when we can be radically honest with ourselves is when we can make radical shifts in our lives. You are not your past, nor should you be burdened by it if it isn't pleasing to you. We may often feel tested by life. Let's say we've woken up to how we have been negatively impacting our own lives with our thinking and we're taking steps to change things for the better. Quite often there will be a pregnant pause between the two realities and this is normal. Do not give up on yourself just because the new reality you're imagining for yourself hasn't taken shape yet. It's an act of faith, self-love, self-awareness and conscious action. Just imagine any ship that is sailing along in one direction and suddenly needs to make a big turn. You turn the ship's wheel and expect it to turn like a car, but for a moment, sometimes a very, very long moment, nothing seems to happen. That's because between the shift in the rudders and the weight and speed of the ship and the resistance of the water, there is a process by which all of these elements engage to make that ship turn around. You hold your breath in a slight panic, wondering if it's going to turn, and then suddenly it does. The same thing can often happen in our lives when we make changes, especially when it comes to how we think about things. Some changes happen fast, some happen more slowly based on other circumstances. We need to have patience and keep exercising those thoughts for a better outcome. We need to keep steering our ship in the direction that we wish for it to go. So let's do another fun exercise that you can download from this episode's show notes and from my website. You can pause this after each question and write down your answers, or at least think about them and then do this later when you can write them down. Here we go. If you were to imagine something different and more pleasing about your life today, what would it be? Think and feel into it as deeply as you can. Is it just for you or does it involve or impact other people? Why is it important for you? What will happen if you achieve it? What won't happen if you achieve it? What will happen if you don't achieve it? What won't happen if you don't achieve it? Now you're going to turn this into a short story about yourself. Write it from the perspective of having already accomplished it with all the insights you've just gained from the questions above. Imagine all the wonderful things that have happened for you. 
Imagine how you feel about yourself now. I hope these questions help shed some light and inspiration for your present and future. It is actually brighter than you may have been thinking before. I also hope it's clear to you now that you do have imagination and that it's simply a question of how you're directing your own thoughts. I know that life can be challenging at times and it's as though certain things have been designed to kill off our childlike desire for innocent play and imagination. We're somehow pushed into an adult lifestyle that doesn't offer much room for play unless one plays tennis, golf, football, basketball, hockey, or name your favorite sport. Play and imagination are food for the soul and the brain. They feed the creative part of our minds that helps us be resourceful at work, in our relationships, in our communication, in fixing things, or innovating. It's a beautiful space that we get to indulge in, and nobody has a right to take that away from us. So, here's to your imagination. It's your mind, it's your world, and you get to choose your experience of it. I'll be happy to hear your thoughts, insights, and experiences. See you in the next episode. As we wrap up today's show, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. It means a lot to me. You see, whenever we create something, we always take a leap of faith into the unknown, and we don't always know how it'll work out. That's part of what this podcast is about, encouraging all of us to take leaps of faith on our ideas, dreams, and creations, and having a safe space to explore them to build the strength to get back up when we fall, and to celebrate when we fly high. I'd love to know what your big takeaway is from this episode. Tell me what you're working through and what you'd like to know more about. Also, is there someone you'd like me to interview on the topic of genius? Let me know. Email me at hello at karenpinter.com or message me on my socials. In the meantime, take care of your genius self.